Welcome back to the Life on Books podcast. I'm your host, Tony. With me, as always, is Andy, a.k.a. Metafictional Meathead, and we have a very special episode today. <laughs> this episode is the Where the Fuck Have You Guys Been episode. Yeah, yeehaw. The, we, the life update for Life on Books. Yeah, so we ended 2023 super strongly. We had all these grandiose plans, and then uh, life happened. So we're going to... Uh, In the words of Mike Tyson, or was it... Ali, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Yeah, one of the, somebody, maybe Rocky. I don't know. Who is? Yeah, some boxer. So, at least one of us got punched in the mouth, and uh, yeah, I, I I took some 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 beatings, not not nearly as bad as you, but uh, so we are going to talk about books today. We'll find a way to make that work, but uh, we're also just going to give you all of our excuses. <laughs> and uh, I guess Andy, I'll let you lead here because it's really up to you how much you are inclined to share or not share yeah well yeah so like you like you said tony we ended 2023 strong we recorded our our year-end review or recap whatever which was popular it has like two thousand views on youtube yeah that was a good one got a lot of good feedback on that um which is a lot for a three-hour episode (laughs) right thank you to everyone who who watched that listened whatever Yeah. yeah so we we took we did that video, took a short break the weekend following recording that. I went to visit my parents. Uh, I hadn't gotten a chance to celebrate Christmas with them yet. So I did that. And then uh, the weekend after that, before we got a chance to um, record any further episodes, my now ex-girlfriend confessed to cheating on me. So uh, it's, there it is, folks. Yeah. Ripping uh, the Band-Aid off. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, she didn't listen when we were together, so f*** it. Uh, she's not going to listen to this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it... Uh, not unless I make the title of the episode, uh, Andy's Cheating Ex-Girlfriend Exposed here, or something let's, like that. You know what? Let's get a good uh, real clip for you. Emily, f*** you. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, it was a um, weird and kind of... Tur- turbulent time it was kind of in and out. There was a bit of a uh, bit of a, a, a limbo between the confession and then the relationship ending. Um, Finding new places to live. Yeah, dealing with threats to go to small claims court. All sorts of uh, bullshit uh, is just you know been a um, pretty pretty nasty. Uh, messy breakup on top of the, uh, I guess, traumatic aspects of it. So, yeah. So, you know, I, I obviously don't want to spend the whole episode talking about this one because it's your personal business, two because that's not what we do here. <laughs> However, I do think that we do have a pretty close relationship with a lot of the people that listen regularly. Yeah. I'd consider some of them friends, even though we might not have ever met in person. And of course, some people we have met in person that are, are listeners. I will say that. I was not necessarily surprised that she cheated on you uh, and not because I thought she was a cheater, but I've just always felt she's a selfish person. Yeah. And full disclosure, I was never a huge fan. However, I try to be very respectful of my friends' relationships. I'm not the one that has to be with that person, so it's up to them. But, you know, we had received comments or I had received comments from other people just in like, them witnessing interactions between the two of you and how she spoke to you. And I think what stands out the most to me is the day that we, I met her, you were competing in a powerlifting competition, uh, which if you're not into powerlifting can be a little boring, understandably so. But we all went to lunch after and I was like, so what'd you think of like your man competing? She was like, Oh yeah, that was cool. And like, kind of like shit on it. And I was just like, Oh, all right. Like, yeah, no. Way that to be was, supportive, you know. And it's like you're just you just met all of his really good friends, <laughs> and you're just like dogging him. And I was like, okay, all right, yeah, so that's that was be. Uh, that was something that kind of uh, it took me by a little bit by surprise after uh, everything hit the fan, finding out the uh, <laughs> number of people that that didn't like her, and uh, you know whether we get into the specifics or not, uh, her nah, actions over to, yeah. her actions over the last month or so have kind of uh, shown me why. But yeah, I mean, and you and I have had this conversation a couple times over the last month and I, and I don't want to justify 
emotional betrayal of any sort because it's it's not okay. But you know, humans are flawed beings and they they make emotional decisions and they make mistakes. And that on its own sucks enough, but then it's like you're consciously aware that you did something wrong and then you just basically triple down on treating that person like shit. it's yeah. just like okay you, you're claiming you're acknowledging you did something wrong but now you're demanding that you you be the one to move out of the apartment even though it's in both of your names yeah. and all these things there's just like behavior that you would only do to somebody if you are just either you just literally don't care about them at all or you're just a bad person like you yeah. you're just so selfish that you literally do not care how your actions impact other people. And so that was, I guess, uh, for me, the most frustrating thing. Not not to say that, you know, it's okay that she cheated on you. However, it's just like, if she was like, look, I want to be with somebody else or, I, or at the bare minimum don't want to be with you, th that is what it is. People feel the way they feel. But then to, like, consciously, like, make you the bad guy and try to, like, make your life more difficult so she didn't have to experience any inconveniences whatsoever was very unfortunate. I don't want to say shocking because I guess deep down it's not that surprising to me, <laughs> but it, it's, it is very unfortunate. I will say that. Yeah. Yeah. You pretty much nailed it. Um, she's been very selfish and narcissistic. And I think um, some things that had kind of come to mind and some realizations that had started to click um, uh, in the last few weeks kind of made it, much more of a significant betrayal than I kind of uh, experienced at first. Yeah. Um, it went from being like, a, ooh, it was a whoopsie to, oh, this, I actually want to be with this person. It went, or, yeah, yeah. To, to not even just that, um, but also like it not just like a, oops, I made a mistake this one time. It's It was something that, uh, you know, based on things she had said, like she had the impression that it was going to happen. Right, right, and, right. And uh, didn't do anything to stop it. In fact, only doubled down and um, kept strengthening that possibility. Yeah, and uh, we haven't even touched on what I think is the worst part of it all, which I, we don't need to bring up. Nah, do it. Okay, okay. All right, well, I'm going to spill all Andy's beans here. So not only did he make the mistake of dating this person in the first place, but they also worked together, and the person who she decided to use as the catalyst for blowing up the relationship is also a coworker. So yeah, this so, could not get any worse. No, it's um to uh this would make a, f a fabulous book by the way. Yeah, it it sure would. Um to quote my uh my new therapist, um <laughs> my life is kind of a shell. Yeah. Um but that was that was one of the things I uh definitely struggled with a lot right out of the gate. It's Definitely something that's still kind of in the back of my mind, but yeah. uh, how old are you? To to twenty eight. I just turned twenty eight. Yeah. Um, to quote uh, Jordan Belfort, oh. uh, I'm not fucking leaving. <laughs> so I love it. You know the way the way I see it. Um, I definitely had those moments of like where it was going to, how I was going <clears throat> to adjust, how I was going to figure out how to. Um, fix myself and all that, that good stuff. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, I'm a better person than yes, either of them individually and or combined. Um, <laughs> you know, there are a couple of people that are perfectly made for each other. And, um, you know, if they, they want to come into work and have to see my face uh, as I'm, getting my life back together and have a basically daily reminder of the worst thing they ever did, then that's so their, far there. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> until, they, time. until they each other over, yeah. um, you know, then that's their problem. Not mine. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually agree with that sentiment. I mean, being, uh, more than 10 years, your senior, I've been through a lot. I've been cheated on multiple times. Um, and so I kind of, a lot of how this played out was exactly how I'd, I'd expected it to. 
I don't know how I would deal with having to see both of them on a daily basis because there's never been a situation like that for me, or I don't think most people are in that situation. There might be that awkward, you know, month after the relationship ends where one of you is finding other residencies, but yeah, not to like literally have to go in and interact with them in a professional sense. Yeah, um, yeah. definitely have. Uh, I had at least one moment of kind of letting my emotions get the best of me. Yeah. Um, Which I think you're allowed. But I mean, come on. Yeah. Um, so th- throw, you, throw you a bone here. One, one f- you is not a big deal. Right. You know? <laughs> like, um, but uh, it, it is, uh, turns out I have much more self-control than I realized. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, that's why you're not fat. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, what's you, going on in your life, Tony? Well, I, I will say that um, although the start to my year was not as uh, difficult as yours, it was certainly not easy. So uh, a while back, I had made a video that was incredibly popular about um, why I read, and I kind of made a caption about like dealing with ADHD, which is something I was diagnosed with as an adult recently. And uh, I've never taken a medication for anything in my life. And I've always been kind of of the mindset, like if I could fix something without prescription medication, I'll try that first. And and not to invalidate anybody who finds great benefit from medication, but uh, there, there are basically no situations with any medication in the world um, where there's 100% net benefit. There's always a trade-off, right? There's always side effects. Sometimes they're extremely minimal. Um, but sometimes they're not. So, uh, I was working with a psychiatrist that put me on a few different medications. Nothing was really working as far as just like zero, zero effect one way or the other until we tried, uh, just straight up Adderall. No, I've heard so many mixed opinions about Adderall. Have you ever taken it? No comment. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people are like, it's like a miracle drug. You can get all this work done. And it's like, you know, it's like the limitless pill from the movie. Right. Um, I certainly found some benefit from it. I didn't find it to be that overwhelmingly positive. What I actually was very interesting to me was that I, I felt like it kind of was not consistent. So some days mm-hmm. I would take it and it would be like, my brain was on fire and other days I'd take it and be like, did I even remember to take it? You know, Mm -hmm. uh, which led me to get an actual pill separator. So I didn't run the risk of double dosing. Um, and I went through this really weird period between like the middle of January to the middle of February where I was literally taking it every day, which I was told I can do, but a lot of people like don't take it on the weekends or something like that. But I basically work 24 seven because I work for myself. Right. And so any period of time can be work time if you so choose. And I was got into this weird habit for about a month where I would get up six in the morning, take it and just like start crushing work. And I would work till 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. I was getting less than a thousand steps a day. I was like literally only getting up to go to the bathroom and let the dogs out and uh, just working. And it was great in the sense that like I got kind of really caught up on a lot of projects I needed to tie up, uh, you know, put a bow tie on and, uh, and a ribbon on and, and, and package up, but obviously not healthy otherwise. Right. And so I wasn't reading much. Um, and the other really, really good benefit about it was I've been dealing with really bad sleep apnea, which should have been treated last year, but there was a whole kerfuffle with my insurance company. I have Harvard Pilgrim and for, they got hacked oh. and for three months, uh, you could not log into your like client portal. Yeah. And so I had my account set up on auto bill and I noticed it wasn't being debited from my account. And I went to log in. And it was like, oh, we've been hacked. We'll let you know when it's back. When their system came back online, um, they they were they had not been able to bill anybody for three months. So everyone had a, at minimum a three month <laughs> balance, right? And they were like, you need to pay this in two weeks or we're going to cancel your account, which is like a little extreme considering that like, It's not our fault, right? right? Fortunately, I'm not in a position where that was a big deal, so I just paid the balance. What I did not realize was when their system reset, it did not automatically enroll me in auto billing again. And so a month went by, 
and I didn't pay the next month and they just canceled my policy. <laughs> so I literally got prescribed. Uh, I'm trying to get the sleep study done so I can get my <laughs> sleep apnea treated. And I got prescribed one of these medications and I went to the pharmacy and they're like, oh yeah, you don't have insurance. And I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And I went to like log in and it's like, yeah, you're not a member anymore. And I was like, what the hell? So I had to pay. Um, I think at that point I was like two months behind on that. And so I had to pay that. And before they would even consider re-enrolling me, they're like, yeah, you can pay the two months, but we might not re-enroll you. It's like, well, why would I do that? That doesn't even make sense. Why would I pay you if you're not going to give me the service? Yeah. Fortunately, they, they put me back on my plan, but it took like a month for that. And I had a referral for a uh, sleep study, but referrals expire. And in that period it expired. So I had to go through the whole process again of like, getting a referral from my PCP, getting it approved by this insurance company, booking a time with the clinician to like schedule the sleep study. It was a nightmare. So I just had the sleep study done this week, but um, I was having like terrible daytime drowsiness, like literally like can't read. I'm just like falling asleep as soon as I open a book. And so the Adderall was taking care of that. So that helped a little bit. But then um, during that period of like just working bell to bell, I did not realize that my mental health was like starting to like not be good. Yeah. And I just wasn't like interacting with enough, like out of the outside world to like notice how like grumpy I was, I guess. (laughs) So, um, and then I watched an interview with, um, Dr. Robert Sapolsky. He wrote behave Mm -hmm. and why zebras don't get ulcers. Mm -hmm. And he has a new book out called determined. And uh, so he's a you know world renowned neurobiologist, and based on some of his m- more recent research, he doesn't believe we have free will. And this is not necessarily a concept that's new to me by any means. I mean, there's been lots of philosophers that have posited this over the year, over the years, uh, like Spinoza, um, Schopenhauer, uh, and. The interview was being done by Alex O'Connor, who I think is a PhD of philosophy. He's from the UK and he's got like a podcast or whatever. And he's done episodes about why he thinks there's no free will. So it's not like this is a concept that's like new to me by any means. But there was just something about like my mental state from being on the Adderall and just hearing this guy talk about it. It like threw me through a loop. And I just like had this... um, I guess the term for it's like ontological shock, which is where you like are confronted with something that like challenges your worldview that you like subconsciously hold and you can't like reconcile with it. Yeah. I guess it happens a lot in like the UFO community when like people don't believe in aliens and they see something that literally just like cannot be explained by natural phenomenon. So I literally had a weekend where I was like, life is pointless. Like why even get out of bed? Like, why not just like jump off my deck? You know yeah. what I mean? And I've yeah. never been, I've never had depression. I've never had any kind of suicidal thoughts before. So I immediately stopped the medication. Um, and like day by day, just started to feel better. And I'm, I would say a hundred percent back to normal now yeah. in my mental state, but, um, back to being exhausted because I don't have the stimulant anymore. Right. <laughs> so it's been a rough, a uh, rough start to my reading year. I went from like, just spending way too much time working to having a mental breakdown to now being too tired to read a book. So, yeah. So yeah, we we suck. We're, we're <laughs> like, the, we're like the shittiest book, book podcast in the world. The good news is, is um, during that time of being hi- uh, all hopped up on Adderall, I did batch a lot of the short form content. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've been putting out a lot of stuff lately. Yeah. And that's all, all done. It's all, I've just been sitting on that. I had yeah. over a month's worth of stuff. So yeah, uh, I actually haven't recorded anything in about five weeks or more, uh, which I'm going to record on Monday, get some new stuff coming out. So yeah, I remember when, you know, I, I, I don't remember if it was something we talked about when we recorded the uh, year end recap or if it was just something you and I were chatting about off the air, but I was like, yeah, I, I all these goals for the new year. I want to, you know, I don't necessarily want to focus on the quantity as much. I want to get some deeper reading in, um, try a little bit, be a little bit more studious and take notes, things like that while I'm reading. And, um, whether it's, it was, you know, written content on the, um, the website you set up for the podcast yeah, or just more in depth, 
posts and captions uh, on Instagram or doing some sort of like video content um, in, in some variety. You know, I was like, I definitely want to do more like substantial things talking about what I'm reading. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> life got in the way and I, I have not been able to focus like at all. Um, yeah. I think it's underrated uh, how difficult it is to focus when you have some type of emotional distraction or distress. Yeah. It's, it's actually something I um, had recently talked about in, uh, um, in therapy, which is actually, I'm enjoying. Um, well, that's good. It, it kind of sucks that it took this whole show to get me in, but um, you know, people talk about it like, oh, everyone should do therapy. If you if you like to do that, that's great. Do it. But I don't know if I agree with that. Like, I, you know, it, it's something that I I have kind of had in the back of my mind for a while. Yeah. Like, even if it's not like a consistent regular thing, like, yeah, you know, give it a whirl. And, you know, I had taken a couple attempts. Um, couldn't really get in with anyone. I, I don't even think I did like any like. Um, consultations or intro sessions or whatever oh, really? you want to call them, like you know, y- a year ago, whatever. Um, just got weird vibes from who I had been talking to before it even started. It's hard to find something. And then, like, yeah, um, I got into. Uh, <clears throat> I, I did one intake session um, back in December. Um, And I didn't really think it was a good fit, but some of the stuff he had said kind of changed my perception on how I was feeling. Yeah. Because I was starting to feel like I was getting like depressed, things like that. You know, I think I had told you, um, well, this would have been, it would have been after um, the breakup, but I had told you that I was feeling like just like really like mentally drained. Yeah. And just didn't have, you know, I was, pretty much from everything I was like pouring from an empty cup. Yeah. Um, so I was starting to feel like maybe I was kind of going through a, a depressive period. And um, in that intake session, even though I, that particular therapist ended up not being a good fit, you know, he kind of went through the like clinical markers of depression. And I forget how many there, they, there are and how many you have to, the minimum you have to meet for them right. to like actually move closer to a diagnosis. But like I was, you know, I only had like hit like one or two of them. And he was like, honestly, I think you just have a really a, a problem with stress management. Hmm. Cause like it had it, been a tough few months at work. Um, things were not going great in my relationship. Right. Um, but uh, anyway, going back to what I was saying, Um, something I I had recently been talking about with my current therapist was about how like one of the things that I really enjoy about reading and what has made it such a good hobby, uh, if you will, or it has really helped me kind of keep up the habit is, uh, I really enjoy that kind of quiet, uh, somewhat introspective, um uh time you know yeah. there's no there's no external stimulus whether it's just kind of comprehending and paying attention to what's going on in the narrative or engaging on a a deeper level you know whatever i was it was just me in the book and whatever thoughts i was having while i was reading the book um and unfortunately, the last few months, there have been a lot of thoughts, or um, not last few months, last couple months, um, a lot of thoughts running around in my head unrelated to the book. So, right, right. Um, you know, I kind of find, found myself uh, going back to, you know, time that I, I might have in the past used for reading, like I would just kind of flop on the couch and put the TV on and... Um, sometimes put the TV on and play on my phone at the same time. Sometimes just watch TV. Sometimes just like play on my phone. Yeah. Um, I kind think of, that, you know, was relying a little bit more on that 
external stimuli than I had in the past. I think it's important to point out though, that like that's okay. Yeah. Like reading while it is enjoyable for probably anyone listening to this, it it's still like an active thing. It right. still requires effort and work. And uh, I certainly don't want to dredge up the audio book versus, you know, physical book thing right now, but that is kind of like part of the kind of critique of, you know, audio books being somewhat different than regular reading because it is a little bit more passive. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I think that it's a lot of people have guilt if they're in a reading slump because they feel like I should be doing this. Why am I, why am I doing this lesser activity like watching TV or scrolling Instagram? It's a, we, we kind of make a moral judgment about it, but it's like, okay to give yourself a break. Right. It, it's, it's like exercise. Like, yeah, we all acknowledge that exercise is good for us, but it's like, sometimes you're just burnt out and you just need to rest, you know? And so it, it's not, I think we definitely probably have extra pressures on ourselves because we do have book related social media accounts. We do this podcast and super appreciative of a lot of people reached out. And like, what's the deal? Like, yeah. When is this coming? You know, where, where have you guys been? Which is cool. We have like fans, yeah. but um, you know, it is an extra layer of pressure because you're like, Oh man, like we have to do this. You yeah. Know? So yeah, not even, not even necessarily the reading, but there were definitely some times, um, you know, like you and I had talked about maybe, uh, you know, sitting down and recording and, and not that I like felt any pressure from you, but like, yeah. it was the, the same kind of thing. Like, you know, it hasn't, it's been a while. Like it would be, well, what are we going to talk about? Right. And <laughs> then, you right. Books. Yeah. And then I was just like, I, I don't have the, the capacity. Yeah. You know, this is definitely the closest I've felt since, since that, um, recap we, we recorded to yeah. like, actually be able to sit down and have a, a conversation. So, I mean, I guess we can kind of pivot into, into books from here. We just spent a you know good half hour on uh, the lack of integrity of <laughs> people we know in our personal lives, for lack of a better term. Um, I guess uh, what, um, what, what's the plan for, from here for you for books? Um, what, what are your strategies? Uh, have you thought about how you might get out of the slump? TBD. Okay. Um, right now, you know, my goal is to get just back into the habit, you know. Um, I, I did finish a couple books within the last, um, well, in January, I, I did finish a couple books. Mm-hmm. Um couldn't tell you much about yeah much about them um but i have been kind of slowly getting back into it i've been reading um praiseworthy by alexis wright as a new edition out from new directions which i'm i'm still kind of feeling my way out yeah trying to 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 connect with um i'm i was actually talking to someone the other day who uh, had been reading it as well and he said something like he he was struggling like with you know after a few pages like he'd start to like feel like he was losing focus or mm. or something about it like couldn't click with him um, at least so far in the first kind of section of the book that I'm in like there are seem to be like relatively short chapters um, so that has been nice in the the sense that like. I can read five to six pages or whatever it is, you know, without feeling like I have to make this like big commitment to, to reading. Um, but I've kind of been running into the same thing where like I'll read those five to six pages and then be like, okay, whatever. Mm, yeah. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm still trying to like suss out like if, if it's just lack of connection with the book or if it's your frame of mind, my, yeah, my, my mind, um, state, um, or somewhere in between. Um, so I, I don't really have any, um, set plans or goals. Um, you know, I know kind of towards the end of the year, maybe early 2024, I, I posted 
pretty ambitious stack of, of books um, that I was hoping to get to this year. Um, you know, my, my plan right now is to just kind of, I guess, ride the wave and try to get back on track and, and keep the habit up. Um, you know, try to get some daily reading in yeah. so that when things clear up a little bit and I'm in a better, um, headspace, you know, I can, I, I have, you know, we'll keep the habit going. Yeah. And, can kind of maybe sit and do some of those longer reading sessions. Um, that's another thing I've noticed. Like, um, I don't really have the like mental stamina yeah. to sit and read for like a long period of time. You know, in the past year or so, there were times where like I could sit for hour, hour and a half, yeah. maybe two hours. And just if I had nothing to do when I was really – into the book and just read, um, you know, I might be getting like half hour tops yeah. these days. So just, I mean, that's still not bad. Right. Um, you, not to, not to diminish anyone. That's like, yeah, that so, is some 15 minutes is like right. a, a big accomplishment, you know, not, not to diminish anyone that like, that's their kind of max or that's their, their goal is to read 30 minutes a day or, or what yeah. have you. But like, I might not even be getting that much. Like I, you know, like I just said, I, I'm getting like five to six pages and I'm just like, I. There's something I to be said focus. for just like going through the motions in the meantime and just, yeah. you know, it's going it, to, it's going to come back. You know what I mean? It's right. not gone forever. Um, but I do have a um, pretty sweet library office space in my new. Yeah. Your new, new apartment's really nice. New actually. apartment. So that's a cool, cozy place to hang out. And I do think it's important to focus on the positives. So I understand the grass is always greener on the other side. And I have a fantastic relationship that I'm very grateful for. However, there are a lot of very attractive bookish ladies <laughs> on the internet. I mean, I've been propositioned in my DMs and I'm like fat and old. And I'm like, <laughs> Andy is going to have his pick here of, of, you know, <laughs> we might be some logistical restraint uh, constraints with, uh, you know, being in New Hampshire, but if there are any book fans, young lady book fans, uh, you're 28. So what is it? Uh, your age divided by two plus seven. Uh, that's the minimum. Yeah. What's that? 21. Uh, well, half a, 30 14. would be 15, and 28 would be 14, 14 plus 7, 7 21. 21. And what's the oldest you would date, you think? I don't know. I wouldn't advise over like 35. I think the, I think you're in too much of a different place in your life at that age. Yeah. When you're, If you're like 35 and single, you're probably like, I need to get into a serious relationship and have kids like pretty quickly if, if you want kids, you know yeah. what I mean? So I think in some ways that's kind of... Like the relationship I just got out of. So, yeah, um, <laughs> try to avoid that. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, 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 uh, so there's that. You have that going for you. Um, there's lots of cool book, book gals out there. Um, very smart and attractive that I've seen. Um, so that's good. And I think, like, I think dating is fun. Like it, it can be exhausting if you've been single for a long time and you've been going on a lot of dates and just it's not clicking with anybody you meet. But also like, I do think like meeting somebody new, like that's the most fun part of the relationship. So you get to do that again. So that's cool. Um, and you know, this, this sounds a little crass, but I actually meant this when I said this to you the first time, like none of us really thought she was the right person for you. So I thought she was kind of holding you back, holding you down. So I was like, this is the best thing that ever happened to him. Yeah, I, I think... I mean, um, it sucks now, but... Right. No, I, I think... Uh, I think in a lot of ways, I maybe dodged a bullet or... Uh, Definitely. You know, <laughs> I, I I think in that uh, initial few weeks where I was kind of like, um, you know, really grieving what happened and then grieving the the end of the relationship which in some ways I'm still doing you know I I had found out within shortly over a, a week uh, of us ending the relationship that you know she had gone out and started making plans 
with the other guy. Right. Um, and basically showed no remorse for how that affected me. Uh, it, it changed my perspective of her as a person and, you know, how I looked at the past two years, um, whether it was, it was just, you know, whether it was her, uh, kind of emotionally manipulating me or just me kind of having these negative self thoughts. Like I saw a lot of the, uh, the issues that we were having, um, not necessarily as, as my fault, but I was like hyper focusing on my role in them. Right. And, you know, in the last month or so, I've kind of spent a lot more time thinking about like her role or issues that I had with her, um, things like that. So, well, I, I think kind of like you said, like it, it would probably be for the best. Yeah, I mean, the behavior is in, it, it's very much in line with what selfish people do. So it's like if I decide I want to break up with you, I'm dating you and I want to break up with you, like I have to be the bad guy and I have to, you know, deal with the awkwardness and the un, the how uncomfortable it is to have those conversations where it's like going out and cheating on somebody – you still have to, you know, be the bad guy, but you also are then giving an opportunity for somebody to have a very strong emotional reaction, maybe say something they don't really mean, and then you get to go, ah, aha, you see, you did this thing, and now I can, you know, be mad at you because you called me, a, you know, a bitch or whatever. Right. Like, um, so it's it's kind of like a like weak, emotionally weak people do it as a they grenade their own relationship because they don't have the courage to just like face the person and be like, I need space or maybe this isn't the right relationship for me yeah, or whatever, which I mean, don't get me wrong, still sucks to hear uh, and go through, but at least you can like avoid all of the other emotions that you have to feel when you've been cheated. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I, and I, I'm kind of coming to that realization that it, it wasn't, the right relationship for me. Um, yeah. And even knowing so, that doesn't make it any easier necessarily right. because you, you, change is hard. <laughs> it's, it's, it's made, it has made it a little bit easier. I mean, it's still very weird and awkward and I'm going through a roller coaster of emotions on a weekly, if not daily basis. <laughs> yeah. Um, but slide into those DMS now, ladies, <laughs> get them while he's vulnerable. <laughs> Exactly. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's you know, altered my, my perspective and it's, it's I'm, I'm still grieving things, but it has changed, I guess, what and the way I am grieving. Yeah. So. so let's ask chat GPT, what are the top 10 Classic novels that deal with infidelity. Oh, baby. Let's bring this back to the books. Yeah, let's do it. We're a supposed book podcast. I know there's there must be some that I've read, but I, I just couldn't. Because uh, Katie was like, what are you guys going to talk about? And I was <laughs> like, I'm not sure. <laughs> She's like, why don't you talk about books that deal with like cheaters? And I was just like, that's not the type of books Andy and I read. <laughs> yeah, right. So Anna Karenina by Tolstoy. Uh, haven't read it. Obviously, not. obviously know of it. Uh, Madame Bovary. I had a copy that I got rid of because I read some uh, reviews or something, and I was like, "This is not not for you. Not not something I'm going to get into." Although I have read that uh, Flaub Flaubert Flaub Flaubert. I know he's French, so the author. Yeah, yeah I'm totally going to butcher the pronunciation, but. Um, he was a, a favorite of uh, William Gass. So. Oh, so you have to. Well, yeah, one of these days I'll have to get back around to it. But uh, The Great Gatsby, that's an obvious one. Yeah. I didn't think of it because you don't really think of it as like, you kind of think of her as like his girl. Even yeah. Though, you know what I mean? Like, right. He, he's the one. I don't know. Whatever. 
Um, they weren't coworkers. We'll put it that way. Uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence. Haven't read it. No. I've never read anything by him. Um, Tess of Dubervilles by Thomas Hardy. Haven't read anything by Thomas Hardy. No. The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I read in high school. But I don't I, think I read it. I don't think I've ever read it. Is that what the Scarlet Letter was for? She was an adulteress. I that must have, so. that must have been something right. like yeah. that. That's shameful. And I can't even remember like the basic plot of that. Yeah. Book. <laughs> Shows you how into it I was. Um, Anna of the Five Towns by Arnold Bennett. I've never, I've never heard, of heard of that. I've never heard of him. Chad GPT might be slipping here. Effie Briest by Theodore Fontaine, a German realist novel that tells the story of Effie Briest, a young woman who enters into a loveless marriage with a much older man and faces the consequences of her affair with a young officer. A Doll's House by Heinrich Ibsen. Never even heard of that, mm. either Either the title or the author. The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. Um, that sounds familiar, but I haven't read it. I've had I'm 0 for 10 <laughs> I, I had a copy and then I believe I donated or sold that as well. Yeah. Um, now, the only one on that list I've read is uh, Gatsby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. So one, one, out, of, one out of 10. And one for 10. I, yeah, I read that one in, in uh, high school. It's it's actually funny that that was on the list um, because it, it sort of popped into my head um, recently. I don't really remember why, but it, it popped into my head. Um, and I was thinking about it and I was thinking about something my, um, high school English teacher said when we read it, uh, in high school about how, you know, it's one of her favorites and it, it's one that she's read at multiple different times in her life and always kind of seems to have a different profound effect. Um, you know, she talked about it when she was in high school and then, you know, at some point after college and then one of the, the things that she said that really kind of like stuck out to me, she said something about how like she read it after she got out of a relationship with the, this person that she thought she was going to marry. Oh boy. And I was like, maybe I should or shouldn't, or I don't really know, but I don't even think I have my copy anymore. So, Damn. All right. Well, we'll have to put some of these on the list, I guess. Yeah. I don't think... Uh Nothing else really springs to mind with like a strong theme of infidelity. I mean, again, it's just not really like the type of books. I think we, uh, we don't read romance, so I think I could be wrong, but I know there's a. It's kind of a, a favorite or um, you know a, a holy grail almost amongst the the literary snobbish bookstagram community is uh, Darkenville's Cat by Alexander Thoreau. I think there's some. I've never even heard of that affair. Uh, it's pretty rare. Oh, um, okay. It's it's you. Good luck finding a copy for a, a decent price. Gotcha. Um, I believe that has some uh, adulterous themes to it. Sweet. But uh, damn. All right. Well, uh, if you guys have any recommendations about uh, good books dealing with infidelity, drop them in the comments. I don't know if that's what I'm going to be gravitating towards these days. So I yeah. Uh, Gonna try to not trigger any yeah. <laughs> sort of uncomfortable feelings. I mean, you know, I, I've been through a few book slumps in my life. I think what I found it really helpful is just like just rifling through books. Like yeah. pick up a book, read a little bit. If it's not clicking right away, just move on. Just go pick up something else and try something else. And yeah. I actually did that this week. I, I went through like five different books and I just landed on uh, this book that comes out in a couple months, uh, Then I Am Myself the World by Christoph uh, Koch or, or Koch. I don't know how he pronounces his last name, but um, he's a, a neuroscientist. And the whole book is about consciousness and where it comes from. And Interesting. Yeah. So after I, you know, had this uh, this ontological shock, for lack of a better term, you know, I kind of came back down to earth and I was just like, okay, like, this is obviously just one person's opinion uh, about the brain and how it works and all this stuff. And obviously Robert Sapolsky is basically a, a genius, but um, I wanted to have a little bit more, uh, I guess more of the intellectual tools to understand some of the concepts he's talking about or yeah. to even possibly consider alternative theories because, um, and that that's actually taking me down this really 
this is what I love about books, right? So like this, he's, he's got a book coming out. It's all about this topic. So he's doing the rounds on social media and interviews and all that stuff to promote it. Um, and it's opened up a totally new world to me of, of topics that I normally wouldn't even be on my radar. So, um, you know, I got uh, a couple other books by a few other, um, scientists, PhDs that are involved with, you know, cognitive function and evolutionary biology and all that stuff. So I've been learning a lot more about that kind of thing. And then also learning um, about some like stuff that I never even considered like quantum mechanics. Damn. Uh, and so basically, you know, I, I don't know if you know anything about quantum mechanics and someone who's versed in this topic will probably laugh at my uh, explanation of it. But, you know, essentially we we found over time that the universe has laws and everything that we can see and measure fits neatly and obeys those laws like gravity and light mm-hmm. and how all that stuff travels. And, you know, at one point we thought like the atom was like the smallest thing in the universe, but then we discovered subatomic particles. They're even smaller than atoms. And those particles actually do not behave in a, a predictable way according to Newtonian physics. And so there's like certain calculations that quantum mechanics people can do, I guess, that can show several different outcomes of how a subatomic particle is going to behave. And like sometimes it does A and sometimes it does B. And like I guess science doesn't really have a strong explanation for why that is yet. <coughs> um, and so that's been really interesting to learn about. Again, that's a very probably like – low level explanation of (laughs) that very complicated science. Um, But then I've also been learning about this concept of emergentism. Are you familiar with this? No, this is super interesting to me and it's actually a little bit more on the philosophical side, but it, it it does converge like mathematics and science and computing. And basically what it says is like, well, so um, there's a fantastic book called a brief history of nearly everything by Bill Bryson. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's essentially, that book is essentially a a history of the sciences. And so hundreds of years ago, you might be a scientist and you would study all different kinds of things, animals, people, geology, and all this stuff. We didn't have all these subsets of science. And then as we got more refined, people started to specialize. And so it wasn't just science as a whole. Now I might be a biologist and I might be a geologist. And now there's even like hyper niches like, you know, evolutionary biologists that study neurology. Like, you know what I mean? So it can get really niche down. And the kind of prevailing theory behind it is like all of these subsets are so technical that you need to really like focus on them. But it's also created this kind of like pervasive belief in the scientific community that like we constantly need to reduce things down to like the smallest Mm -hmm. part. And interestingly, like some very, very, very bright scientists wrote about like the dangers of that thinking, not the dangers, but like the folly of that thinking, like even as early as like the 40s and 50s Um, and basically being like, that's that's not really how the world works. Like all these things like work together in unison. And so emergentism is the kind of concept that um, complex systems are an amalgamation of many things but no single thing from that system can be extracted and demonstrate what that complex thing does. So a really easy example would be like, if you see a tornado, Mm -hmm. we know that that's made up of like wind and water and you know, what other elements cause a tornado to happen, but you couldn't pluck a water molecule out of a tornado and be like, here's a tornado right here. Like, the water molecule by itself does not create a tornado. It cannot create a tornado. Uh, Another example is like um, muscles. You know, you have like tendons and muscle fibers and muscle cells, which are special cells that have special functions aside from like normal human cells. But like if you pluck down a muscle cell by itself, there's nothing in there that indicates really like what a muscle does or or how it moves. Um, And so it kind of all stems back to this like argument of like free will, interestingly, because, you know, basically, so uh, again, this is maybe a a too reductionist explanation of it, but like Sapolsky's theory is that like 
all of our th- all of our conscious thoughts start with subconscious thoughts. So how can we really say like we are making the decisions if they're starting as like or also like you know you can't make a choice unless you've been like told some certain information that like helps you make that choice. So it really just comes down to like what you want to consider your definition of free will to be. Like, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, I think his thinking is a little bit flawed. It's like, you're basically just saying we're not omniscient, which is like self-evident, but um, you know, there is this like interplay between our conscious mind and our subconscious mind where they go back and forth with each other and that space could be what we call free will. You know what I mean? And right. we can't necessarily measure that. You might not be able to. It's like, I don't know really what like scientists expected. They're like, oh, we can actually do an fMRI of the brain and see neurons as thoughts are formed. It's like, what do you think? One of them is going to be a marble that said free will on it. Like, right. you know, so it's just a really interesting debate. Um, and the people that are having this debate at that level are all so much smarter than I am that it's hard to understand fully like both sides of the argument, but it's super interesting. So just from having that one meltdown, I've learned about like two, <laughs> two new types of sciences. Um, and emergentism is also uh, similar to another theory called complex systems theories. And basically this book that I'm reading by Christoph uh, Koch is like um, his take on why we're not just like machines basically. Uh, and it's so far, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, the guy's like a world-class PhD of, of the, of his field, uh, worked with one of the scientists back in the day that like discovered like DNA sequencing. So he's like incredible. He's like a genius, you know? And he's almost 70 and he like talks about how like he did shrooms to like, because people always talk about how that will like reframe your consciousness right. yeah, and stuff, yeah. and it's like <clears throat> kind of cool that this dude with this like really hardcore science background is just like, let's try it, see what yeah. happens, you know? I dig it. So, um, I found that super interesting, and like I, I was going through that slump, and I rifled through a bunch of books, and I just started reading that, and it, it, it just totally like you just pick up that book, and it's like, right, this is the one it just hooks you. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I gotta definitely gotta get back on track, find something that. Um, can pull me in. So maybe I'll uh, have to get myself back into some Clarissa Spector. She's never done me wrong. Yeah. And that's like, she does like short stories, right? Just short stories. Her, her novels aren't very long right. either. Um, I, I'm, I think a little over halfway through that book, too much of life. I know I talked about it. Yep. Um, and th- what's great about that one is like, you can just kind of pick it up and I don't have to worry about like, what happened a hundred pages ago. I don't have to remember yeah. worry about what happened five pages ago, you know? Well, I told you, I think I told you one of my goals for this year is to read a l- more bigger books. Yeah. And, um, I started the year with, uh, the anarchists who shared my name, which was like 590 pages. It's, so not the, the longest, but certainly not short. Right. And, uh, I just picked up, um, a woman back from Moscow by Ha Jin. It's his latest novel came out in 23. That's 750 pages. And I started it and I like it, but I was like, this is the type of book where I'm not going to be able to just read this. Right. I'm going to have to supplement something else in because the first, I think six pages is a character list. And I was like, uh, and they're all Chinese names, yeah. which if you're an American are, can be hard to remember. Right and differentiate just because they're so different from the names you encounter here on a normal basis. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's it, so far I'm enjoying it. It's well written, but it's also like, it, I, I think it's kind of like a interplay between like politics and this woman's like acting career and how she wants mm. to be this actress. Yeah. And, um, you know, it takes place in like 1940s China. <laughs> Yeah. It's just like this is gonna be a beast of a book. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's funny. I don't remember if it was like if I saw something on Instagram or if it was something I saw on Reddit or whatever, but I saw something and I don't remember if it was about against the day in particular or if it was just about pension in general. Yeah. But like I saw this post and I was like, Oh, now you know what? Now is the time. I'm I'm doing it. Against the day, I'm gonna finish all of my pension. 
uh, reading. And then that lasted about 90 seconds. And I was like, no, Andrew, <laughs> what am I doing? This is not the time. Yeah. Like, you, no, you, no. Well, so. I think, I think, uh, we should, that was an hour. So we'll, we'll start to wrap this up. Um, I'll give a couple rapid fire tips that I found helpful to get out of a reading slump might not apply to you just because you kind of have, you know, some peripheral stuff. <laughs> Uh, but if you just find yourself in a reading slump in general, what things I, I think help reading short books, like I said, you know, if you're not digging a book within the first 10 pages, just put it down. Doesn't mean it's a bad book. You can't, you can go back to it later, but just, just try something else. See if something else hooks you. And I actually find buying books really motivates me to read. Yeah. Um. You know, I go home, I get a bunch of new books and I just sit there and I look at them like, like, Oh, which one do I want to read now? And yeah. you, know, you have more choices. And sometimes what's, what's really funny is like, I'll get a stack of new books and I'm like, wow, I'm so excited to read these. And then I'll be like, look at books I already own. I'm like, you know what though? I haven't, I've had this for a while and I haven't read it. And so I'll grab yeah. something I've been sitting on. Yeah. Um, I've, I've definitely been doing a lot of uh, emotional book buying and, and doing some, some retail therapy, but there have been times in the past where um, I've, I've kind of gone to a bookstore with that in mind of like, whether I leave with, Two books or seven. Yeah, I I go in with the idea that like okay, something I leave with today is going to be my next read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that's you know, um, it certainly I don't think I was you know haven't really gone through a reading slump in a while, but like you know there are definitely times where if I'm like you know where I was like I'm not sure what I'm going to read next or like whatever like doing that. Yeah, it makes it a lot. You should take this easy. with you if you want. Um, I've heard really good things about it. it just came out. Um, the end of the world is a cul-de-sac uh, by Louise Kennedy. And uh, apparently it's excellent short stories. Oh, so cool. 15 novels squeezed between two covers. All right. And it's new. So it's trending, you know, I forget what it's about, but I remember, I remember reading the synopsis and being like, Oh, this sounds good. This is a cool uh, title. Yeah. Oh, let me grab that receipt. I need that for my records. Yeah, shout out to Gibson's Bookstore uh, in Concord, New Hampshire. They had a 25% off sale last weekend to help Andy cope. And uh, Yeah, I, I, I came out with uh, some good good books there. Yeah, I think I spent maybe 70, 75 bucks. Yeah, I spent like 60 bucks. So. I think I bought, I picked up two books while we were there and pre-ordered a couple more. I cool. about three while we were there. I don't remember. Can't keep track of it all. All right, well, there you have it, folks. That's where we've been. Um, we have one episode that we recorded last year that I've been sitting on, the works in translation. Yeah. So my plan is uh, I'm going to put this out this week. Today is the third, second. Uh, so I plan on getting this out this week. I plan on getting the works in translation out the following week. And hopefully by, <laughs> by then we'll be back up and running in our – normal schedule and have things to talk about. If you have any attractive, smart, caring, kind female friends in the New England area that enjoy books, slide into Andy's DMs. I just, I'll, I'll end on saying that uh, you're a good dude, man. You know what I mean? You're a good friend. Um, if, you, if you've listened to the episodes before, you know that Andy used to work for me. Uh, I had an employee that was also guilty of many moral feelings <laughs> and was basically trying to blackball me, which uh, I am uncancelable, just an FYI, in case anyone was wondering. Um, and Andy don't, was... Don't, don't put that juju out. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't tempt. Well, uh, it's because I, I have a sugar mama, so... Um, <laughs> but uh, no, so, um, you know, I, I counted on you then. You were super reliable. You're honest as the day is long. You're a smart guy. Uh, you know, you're going to be fine. Uh, Thank you. I'm actually excited for you to meet somebody that we can go on double dates with. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited to uh, to focus on some other things. I don't want to fall into that cliched. I got to focus on myself, do me thing. But yeah, I mean. I'm 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 excited to do some other things. Um, some some hobbies of mine that I I've had for a while, but. I wouldn't say I held back on or, yeah. or, you know, did lesser of, well, um, I mean, but, but kind of kept it to a, a certain extent to try and give time and space for, for my 
relationship right. for um so that I could be at home to do certain things so that that she could have space to do right. some of her stuff. Right. Um which turned out to be I mean, you know, a, you live and have, you learn. Having an affair. Um <laughs> but, you know, um I'm I'm excited for for some stuff that I I I'm hoping to get more involved with in the future. So yeah, I agree with you. I think it can be a trap. Like people go through a breakup and they think that there's something wrong with them and, and nobody's perfect, you know, and, and everyone makes mistakes in their relationship. Uh, but look, it's not like you were an abusive drunk yeah. or you emotionally abused her in any way. You're just a normal dude trying to live your life as yeah. best you can. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's not like you got to go run out and fundamentally change something about yourself. Uh, just, yeah, I think uh, other than maybe just making yourself a priority. You yeah. Know what I mean, yeah. so. All right. Well, uh, if you have any words of encouragement um, or books you think either of us should read to deal with our, um, you know, emotional struggles in 2024, please let us know. And uh, I think we're back. Are we back? Yeah. yeah. All right. We're, we're back. back. We are back, baby. Number one podcast. <laughs> Watch out, Rogan. Watch out, Rogan. Yep. Uh, Huberman, we're coming for you. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. See ya. That was cool.